Here with this week's hottest stories in the investment world, this is Zach's Friday Finish Line. Hello, and welcome to the Zach's Friday Finish Line. I'm Ryan McQueenie, a content writer here at Zach's, along with one of our editors, Maddie Johnson. Hello there. Today is Friday, September 23rd, and we're here to recap this week's biggest stories. I will note that we won't be talking about Brangelina. Yeah, well, that's the true. Yeah, that's the biggest. We're not. This isn't a pop culture podcast, unfortunately. I know. Because if it was, I think we could do probably a whole, definitely a whole half hour, probably more like an hour on it. (laughs) Um, But anyways, long story short, love isn't real. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) It is devastating. (laughs) Yes. So it has been. It wasn't just a big week for Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. It's also been a big week for Congress as it. Uh, matches up against corporate America um, in a, just a great head-to-head in that we saw yes, Wells Fargo versus. and Milan. So we'll talk about both of those stories in kind of our feature of the story of the week. Um, but first, I want to check in on two companies that we heard about in our exclusive interview with Kathleen Smith from uh, Renaissance Capital. And uh, she predicted that to while she predicted several companies um would be heading for an ipo soon and lo and behold two were right (laughs) two of them debuted this week so maddie wanted to fill us in on so the first company it's called the trade desk and they are a digital advertising platform so they debuted on the market on wednesday and right off the bat their stock which is the ticker ttd it went up like 67 percent that day Mm. um and it priced um, at the higher range at $18 a share, um, which was at, in the higher range of their already revised price range um, from $16 to $18 per share, which they announced on Monday. So it was a big day. It was a big week for the company, mm-hmm. a big day on Wednesday for them. Um, and then on Thursday, Elf Beauty Inc., which is a low priced cosmetics maker, which you can find their products at Walgreens, at CVS, at even Old Navy randomly. I don't, you have you been, you've been to an Old Navy, right? Of course. Yeah. So their checkout I love line. Old Navy. Yeah, so their checkout aisle is like filled with like random like samples sure. of different products. Okay. And I guess Old Elf Beauty is featured in that aisle. That is something I would, I don't think I'm looking for cosmetics. Well, I mean, you never know. I I understand what you're saying. (laughs) Other people are, I'm sure. um, Yeah, so Elf Beauty, you can get um, like a lipstick for as little as $3, which is very cheap in the world of cosmetics. Okay. I can personally attest to that. Um, But so they debuted on Thursday um, at $24 a share and their stock, which is under the ticker ELF, um, it also soared 41% right off the bat. Um, and the company raised $141 million on Wednesday, with, where they priced 8.3 million shares at $17 a share, which is above its indicated range of $14 to $16 a share. So, so interesting. Interesting, yeah. yes. Um, they both did very well. Yeah, notab- notably um, good, solid performance and... Um, you know, heading before they even um, debuted, having to be priced higher than uh, previously announced ranges, um, and then still performing very well after that. Yeah. Um, um, and if taking what we learned from Kathleen Smith of Renaissance Capital, um, solid performance on these IPOs that we are seeing. Um, could indicate that the IPO market is finally starting to warm up. So. Yeah, and it seems like this week has been one of the most successful weeks of the year in terms of IPOs. Sure. Which is great. Um, so in another update, You heard it here first, though, also. I just wanted to say that. On the, <laughs> you, heard, you heard it here first on the Friday finish line. That, that is these true. These two companies were going public by the end of the year, and just weeks later, here we are. So. Yeah. Um, so, Ryan... So it was like kind of a big week for Netflix, which is our, True. one of my favorites streaming one of, video. One of my favorites options. too, yeah. and we've talked about it on the show um, many times. So yeah, Netflix. It was the big week for them. I don't know whether to say it was an announcement because it wasn't really a, a public company announcement. It wasn't a press release type of situation. But right. speaking at the Goldman Sachs. Communicopia Investors Conference great name. Day. I will say, great name. <laughs> um, I'm just going to assume my invite for that got lost in the mail, <laughs> but you know, maybe we'll see you next year, Goldman Sachs. 
Anyway, Netflix's CFO, David Wells, announced that the company plans on making half of its original con half of its total content original programming um, over the next few years. So I guess Pretty yeah, cool news. Yeah. I love Netflix I mean, shows. I mean, yeah. So we've got Stranger Things has been all the rage all mm-hmm. summer. Um Emmy award winning shows like House of Cards, um, Orange is the New Black. Orange is the New Black. There's a Narcos. Narcos. Um, I mean, there's just at this point, it, there's even tons of smaller, lower budget things yeah. even fa- filling Making out a the roster. Making a murder has to be a good one too. Um, and we've seen them go into films mm-hmm. too. So Beasts of No Nation. Um, they have a contract with Adam Sandler that guarantees, I think, four or five. Um, Interesting. Netflix That's exclusive cool. films that Adam Sandler is starring in, but also producing. Um, so that's definitely notable that they've started getting into motion pictures more as they are full length pictures, at least um, now that they, they have this plan to go to 50% of their library is original programming. Um, he also, or Wells in the, in this speech or in this presentation at this conference also said that, Netflix is already about one third to halfway there. Yeah. So if my if my uh, math serves me any cor- <laughs> any uh, if my math serves me correctly, they're almost at twenty five percent. Yeah. Of the library is original content. I mean, whenever I scroll through looking for things to watch, almost I mean, there's a ton of Netflix content. Netflix original content just already there. So, I mean, I'm not surprised if they're 25%. Yeah. The way um, and they definitely make it clear that, that I'm kind of picturing scrolling through a Netflix library right now. And um, the Netflix original tag is certainly up front and on all of their original programming. Um, also worth noting that how it's done so... Beasts of No Nation, for example, Mm -hmm. it wasn't like someone approached Netflix with the script and said, hey, we should do this movie. It was an independent film that was privately funded, and then Netflix bought the distribution rights to it after the fact. So there's some programming that is like that and some programming that they're more responsible for from the kind of ground-up creative process. Um, So Yeah, because I know Netflix goes in... Um, like Amazon and their prime offering, they go into or they are part of the bidding processes mm. of film festivals. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure if Beasts of No Nation was, was a like, festival. Was a film. festival film. I, don't, I would have to look at um, where. They but I know. Bid, yeah. yeah, they also bid on like films from Toronto and right. Sundance. Yeah. So I mean, just a leg- I mean, it's a legitimate uh, distribution company mm-hmm. now, um, and. It's hard for me with with hearing such a large percentage of their library being original programming, hard now not to draw the HBO comparison. True. Um, Yep. So Netflix is already bigger than HBO by a significant margin. Mm -hmm. But um, I guess that's the same business model in that HBO does, I guess, all every show on HBO is its own thing, but they do air a lot of movies still that are not theirs. Yeah. Although, you know, they've definitely ramped up production themselves recently, too. So I think that something we always come back to with Netflix is the cost of licensing content from third parties versus the cost of original production. Mm -hmm. I think um, this is an indication that, you know, Netflix has hit this stride of, okay, we can create our own content for much less money than we can um, go out and go out and, and people like and people yeah. also happen to also really like our content yeah. so um, well and also i uh want to point point out that wells noted that or made sure to note that not every original production may like they it may not be a home run like in no new tv show like not every tv show can be a house of cards sure um but i think that it's important that they're I guess getting more and more of content like that out. Well, and they're hitting a pretty good. To use a baseball analogy, they're hitting a pretty good average right now. Yeah, um, yeah, that's and true. And it seems like just every few months, it's like I knew nothing about Stranger Things 
until the day it was released and then ever i no one has stopped talking about it yeah since then. so um it's it feels like every few months they hit this home run yeah. where this new season of something they just posted is the most amazing thing everybody right. has ever seen so and bringing it back to hbo where i feel like hbo is known for their incredible content consistently oh, yeah always. so i feel like netflix is like it's bigger than them, but it's also has a little bit more to go with. Con- yeah. like content they haven't wise. made the wire yet. They haven't made the yeah. Sopranos no. yet, you know, or maybe they have. And it's just, I mean, I'm still waiting for a Netflix game of Thrones. Stranger <laughs> things, stranger things seasons. A uh, good point. I can't believe I forgot to get, but I didn't mention game <laughs> of Thrones in that same breath, which is shame on me. But, um, Stranger Things season two in production. Moving on. Yes. <laughs> um, so we are going in, as I mentioned at the top of the episode, we are going to go into this conversation about the evils of corporate America as they go up against Congress this week. But before we get into congressional hearings, um, we're going to talk about some news from one of America's least popular companies. And I'm going to say that at, with the, um, I guess, warning i don't know warning's not the right word for it but um i'll say that with a little asterisk next to it it's not my like subjective opinion that they're the least popular i'm baking that off of customer satisfaction (laughs) surveys um i'm i have nothing against the the company is comcast i didn't even say it i have nothing against them specifically i i've had very few horrible tragic terrible experiences with them but it seems like a lot of people have and it's always the company that gets brought up when you're like asked, well, what was your worst customer experience? Yeah, it was on the phone with Comcast. Yes, so, always. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Comcast. So at the same investors conference, I believe, the Communicopia. What the this heck? This is apparently a huge thing. Where were we? <laughs> I know. Um, so the CEO of Comcast, Brian Roberts, they announced, he announced that Comcast is going to launch a mobile phone service. So mm-hmm. if you were wondering... Well, why can't my cell phone provider be Comcast? <laughs> <laughs> now you're in luck. <laughs> right. Um, I'm just going to throw that out there before we get into the other details. I don't think that thought was had by <laughs> anyone. Zero Probably people. not. Maybe one or two. You and never know. definitely not by customers of Comcast, which is <laughs> uh, ironic because of the details of what he said about the service. So. Yeah. So the service is set to launch sometime Next year, I think by the middle of next year. Um, and it the large focus will be on Wi-Fi hotspots. Mm-hmm. And Comcast currently has 14 million Xfinity Wi-Fi hotspots in the country. Which so. is something I will give them a thumbs up on. Because yeah, if ton. you are a Comcast customer, you have access to Xfinity hotspots in a lot of really big metropolitan areas. Definitely. Um, and, and even can, personal routers, if they have like a guest option, right? Yeah. Um, if they work, if, um, <laughs> if as, they work. as an Xfinity <laughs> as an Xfinity customer, uh, the free Xfinity Wi-Fi hotspots tend to be hit or miss, at least here in Chicago. Yeah. I don't know. I I can't speak for anywhere else, really. Yeah. Um. But if so, the network if it's not operating on wi-fi connections it's going to work through verizon's wireless network Mm -hmm. um which i'm i use verizon it's pretty good in chicago at least Mm -hmm. i'm not sure about other places in the country um but mr roberts goes on to say that because comcast has a good and fair relationship to sell on a wholesale basis they won't have to make the kind of investment needed otherwise which is cell towers and other cell cellular infrastructure. Expensive things. Very expensive. So they'll be able to save quite a lot of money by partnering with Verizon. Which I think is good news for investors. Definitely. Because they're not going to be hit with this upfront cost that could um, be a hit or miss type of situation. Yeah. Um, that being said, I don't... Hmm, <laughs> don't hmm, are my thoughts on this? Because... <laughs> I don't know what uh, the, you know, as we mentioned, uh, I think they're looking to market this to their existing customers. Yes, they are. But I don't know how much of a demand there is for this. And also, um, I don't, you know, like I've said, this is a company that consistently struggles with customer satisfaction. Um, 
So trying to sell your unsatisfied customers other services seems to be um, a little questionable, something that could maybe. be difficult. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he. this is like very little information that he gave about the True. service. I mean, yeah. so we still don't know any price details, like where, like what phones it'll be available on. Mm-hmm. Um, Good point. So maybe they'll offer some great in, like introductory introductory deal or you get a deal if you're already a pre-existing Verizon customer probably something like that I will withhold my judgment until yeah some something more substantial is announced very true Um, I didn't get the memo that everyone was going to be announcing things at this Golden (laughs) Sachs conference this week but apparently it happened Um, and so with that I'm glad that this is an easy transition because Comcast talking about customer satisfaction Um, they're definitely one of those few companies that almost everyone can point to and go, yeah, I've definitely heard things about that company being Mm -hmm. this kind of, um, big corporate force in America. Um, there was a, a whole lot of things going on with this corporate American power this week. Um, and like I said, they faced off, we, we saw a face off in Congress with, the CEO of Wells Fargo on Tuesday, and then we saw it again on Wednesday with the CEO of Mylon, Heather Bresch, who we've talked about on the show um, many times now with the EpiPen scandal. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the Wells Fargo. We'll go in chronological order. Okay. Talk about the Wells Fargo (laughs) one soon. Um, Wells Fargo CEO, CEO, his name is John Stumpf. Stumpf. Um, and he was in front of a congressional committee on Tuesday to answer questions about the company's recent fraud scandal. Um, and I should note that this was a, um, a committee of U.S. senators, I believe. Yes. Um, so, you know, for those of I, I feel like we'll touch briefly on what the scandal was, but I feel like most people have heard about what's going on with Wells Fargo recently. Um, basically the company incentivized, um, it's low level employees. Low, yeah. yeah. So the people, if you go into a Wells Fargo branch, the, the people that are helping you right. basically on a, on a day to day basis, um, the people that you open accounts with, um, those, the, the face that you interact with basically, um, incentivizing those employees to get their customers to open more accounts with the company right um so basically what ended up happening is there was so much pressure put on these bankers that were essentially salespeople to open these other accounts um that there was widespread instant widespread instances of scandal or of fraud um that created this scandal um where bankers were just opening up accounts for people without telling them um people were noticing hey i have seven accounts with wells fargo yeah, that i have these weird fees none I'm of not, them, yeah. yeah what am i paying for i don't i'm not using this i don't remember buying this um and it blew up into this really big story about um banking fraud and um you know yet again um you know eight years after the 2008 scandal, the 2008 collapse. We have this another another big story of banking com- a banking company Just not taking advantage. Yeah, of their of their customers. I would say taking advantage is a good good word for yeah. it or a good phrase for it. So basically, Stump is in front of a panel of senators asking answering questions about these account opening practices. Um, I I think basically to get an idea of how much top executives knew about it how high this went up the company um i think it was something like 5300 employees have been fired as a result of this and stump uh said that it was managers and managers of managers that's a direct quote from tuesday's hearing so um i think also he was trying to prove the point that it wasn't just these low-level people that they were firing they were also firing you know regional people branch manager type of people Um, however, uh, he was very clear in the fact that he did not think that it was a corporate conspiracy, if you will. Um, so quote, 
I do not I do want to make it very clear that there is no orchestrated effort or scheme, as some have called it, by the company. So um protecting his end of things, certainly. We're trying to. And his friends on the, the board of directors, <laughs> I'm sure. Um but uh to say that the senators in the hearing weren't buying it would be an understatement. <laughs> um and I think that's the interestingly enough, bipartisanly not buying it. So Yeah, across the, like across the aisle. Yeah, and I think this is that's something we'll talk about with the Mylon hearing as well. Is it uh, Democrat, Republican, didn't Came matter together on to Tuesday. Literally verbally eviscerate. It didn't matter both this CEOs. week. Yeah, if you have not seen the Elizabeth Warren takedown you of should. the Wells Fargo CEO, you should check it out. Um Elizabeth Warren was, I would say, the most vocal critic on mm-hmm. Tuesday, but also everyone was pretty pissed off. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, Warren uh, basically questioned his accountability. And by the end of her prepared remarks, pretty also, much demanded. She was remarkably his, prepared. Yeah, pretty much demanded his resignation and suggested that he and the company be criminally investigated. Um, Interestingly enough, this week also there was kind of another twist to the story where CNN was reporting that employees uh, who called the company set up, the corporate set up whistleblowing hotline where you could report that these account opening things were happening. um, Those employees who actually reported the instances are told CNN that they faced... um, backlash for their decision to report those things even to the point where some people were getting fired for reporting um, apparently and wasn't no the other reason. reporting supposed to be not was it supposed to be anonymous i don't know if it was an anonymous hotline or what but okay. um fun thing about anonymous reporting is it's never really <laughs> That's anonymous <true. laughs> so um I, i'm glad that you said the word prepared about elizabeth warren because she mm-hmm. certainly was prepared to take down uh john stump People who were not prepared for their congressional hearing this week was Mylon CEO Heather Bresch. Like I said, we've talked about her on the show before. Um, it, you probably are surprised by how much you know about this seemingly um, random pharma CEO um, based off of how much her name has been in the news lately with this whole EpiPen pricing scandal. That one I'll get into less of the details of because we've talked about it on the show before. And if you haven't been living under a rock the past month or so, you've heard about the EpiPen yes. pricing scandal. Um, so she was called into uh, a hearing by the House Oversight Committee on Wednesday um, as co- Congress continues its probe into the company's price hikes on the EpiPen epinephrine auto injector. Um so basically her first line of defense in her prepared remarks was to kind of show she used graphs. I think she brought poster boards. Yeah, in, I saw that. Um, where she she was basically trying to say, well, we don't actually make that much money on uh these standard two packs of EpiPens, which cost six hundred and nine dollars. I think after rebates and whatnot, she was saying the company makes less than a hundred bucks when they sell a pack of EpiPens. Um she basically refused to admit that the company raised the price of the medication in an attempt to make more money. Um, was kind of putting the blame on market demands instead of uh, greed from the company. Mm-hmm. Or not even greed, but just ambition from the company to yeah. make more money. Um, again, people weren't buying it. Um, and they, they, across across the aisle, as you said, people were not buying it. Um, pulled a couple of quotes I wanted to share. Uh, Representative John Duncan, a Republican from from Tennessee, said, quote, I am a very conservative and pro-business Republican, but I am sickened by what I've heard, end quote. That one. Harsh. That one was harsh. Um, Tammy Duckworth, a Democrat from Illinois, our home state of Illinois, um, questioned Bresch about the company's EpiPens for School program, which was interesting because that is the program that's being investigated in an antitrust probe in new york right now yeah the states Mm -hmm. uh, by the attorney general attorney general of the state so um that seems like there is something going on there tammy deckworth called the epipens for schools program which basically mandated that schools who are buying epipens from um 
from right. Mylon signed non-compete agreements right. that they wouldn't shop around or try to purchase it from anywhere else, um, even though there are so limited options anyway. Um, but she called it, quote, an unfair monopoly. Um, and then later, Jason Chavitz, I'm going to, I messed up his name for sure. Chavitz, Chavitz, <laughs> a Republican from Utah, um, after uh, part of Bresch's line of reasoning where she was saying that we're not really making that much money, he said, quote, that doesn't make any sense, end quote. And then, quote, again, this is why we don't believe you, <laughs> end quote. Um, so, oh, yeah. And then Elijah Cummings of Maryland, a Democratic representative from Maryland, um, been around for two decades. He's been on Congress now. So certainly a representative with pharma- or with experience and experience in the pharmaceuticals problems that we've been having recently with the price hikes. Because he was around uh, earlier this year. He was at the hearing where Martin Shkreli, our, <laughs> Shkreli. <laughs> <laughs> our favorite pharma executive. Our pharma bro. Our, our pharma, fave, fave pharma bro. Fave pharma bro. Um, was questioned for the price hikes um, that he and his company at the time, Touring Pharmaceuticals, uh, they, they were the subject of a probe very similar to this yeah. one. Um he likened this Mylon situation to the touring pharmaceuticals situation. And he said, quote, after the hearing, it, this was in reference to um, the touring hearing. Gotcha. Martin yeah, yeah, yeah. Crelly. Um, he said, quote, after the hearing, you know what he called us? Imbeciles. You know why he said that? Because he knew he would go back and do the same thing. So he took his punches. He rope-a-doped us. <laughs> End quote. I just really wanted to say that because rope a doped. I've not said on the podcast yet, but yeah, that was that was everything. how that went for Mylon <laughs> and Heather Bresh. Um, oh, and then there was also a comment about the EpiPens for School program and how uh, the president of the National Association of State Boards of Education, who during her time in that role pushed state lawmakers to make state regulations that forced public schools to keep EpiPens on hand at all times and purchase them from um, Mylon, be a part of this EpiPens for school program, if you will. Um, the president of that uh, association was uh, Heather Bresch's mother. So there was Ooh. a line of questioning about that as well. And uh, conflict of interest, I believe, is the phrase for that in the industry. <laughs> Um, so yeah, there's that. Um, and I think that both of these, um, examples are examples of corporate greed gone wrong. It, I think that's in the middle enough to say, um, it's a, as what, what examples of what can happen when, um, businesses go unchecked for a long time yeah because certainly in the wells fargo situation because that was um, that's like legitimate fraud yeah um, it had been going on for years yeah and I, I remember we spoke off air earlier today about the mylon situation and i think that their defense would in most cases would be there's not really anything saying that they can't raise prices like they have um and i think the, the push now is in hindsight to put regulations on um, the books about price hikes. Um, but to me, and I think what a lot of critics would point to about point to Wells Fargo and point to Milan is that um, it seems deceptive. They don't seem truthful. Um, in the case of Milan's hearing, and I, this is what brings me back to the unprepared statement that I made earlier, um, Heather Bresch just didn't bring a lot of the data on their revenue, their 2015 revenue and their patient assistant programs. Like she couldn't answer the question, how much did you guys spend on patient assistant in 2015? Yeah. Even though she was asked to bring that information to the hearing. Um, I don't know how that happens per se. I don't know how you're well, that it unprepared. Just seems like, it seems untruthful though. It seems yeah, no. purposely deceptive. Yeah, and it just seems like the both CEO John Strump and CEO Heather Bresch I feel like they came to these committees and these these committees and these hearings not thinking mm -hmm. it was as big of a deal. I definitely don't think general. either of them thought that they were going to face the level of contention that they yeah. met from 
both. So I, I mean, maybe that's like a reason why she just like didn't bring that information. But that was, I mean, that was just stupid on her part. Yeah. But it's like I don't feel like they really anticipated the backlash mm-hmm. that they their companies received, even though most like these both of these hearings were after a lot of the media coverage of the scandals. Yeah. And I so I think that both of these scandals though also highlight a growing sense of distrust that this country has for um big businesses. Mm. Um yeah. and not just big businesses in general, but um corporations like this, publicly traded corporations, um even more so that have this or at least feel like they have this responsibility to their shareholders. Um to be posting profits and growing all the time, um, that type of pressure results in situations like this where mm-hmm. um, there's these insane price hikes on drugs. There's these um, scandals where it's kind of up in the air as to who made the call on um, just committing fraud, basically. Yeah. But um, there are also two companies that that have such a huge influence on our daily lives where mm-hmm. Wells Fargo, if you are a consumer, I have all of my life's worth mm-hmm. like in your banks, oh, in your yeah, accounts. And definitely. then Mylan, if I'm, if I have an allergic reaction to something, I need this to certain live. drug to live, yeah. to survive. Yeah. So it's like, there are two companies that have such a direct influence on their customers lives in general. Like, and I think that's what upsets people so much is, and that, that was the the anger coming out of the financial crisis in two thousand eight, mm-hmm. two thousand nine, is that, um, you know, these banks we're talking about mortgages, we're talking about people's homes, which is their livelihoods. Yeah. Um, you know, giving out loans and then, you know, knowing that the bubble was about to burst and continuing to market mortgages, continuing to market subprime mortgages, um selling those more bundling and selling those mortgages and then um almost at times betting for them to fail um which yeah. uh, that really upsets people but i guess my question here and it, it gets down to a kind of a fundamental perception of human behavior even is um are these people these corporate devils that we're making them out to be or is this this just the result of a broken system, um, a system where of being we don't have yeah we don't have enough checks and balances in the system. There's not enough regulation in pharma pharmaceuticals. There's not enough regulation in banking um, where these companies can basically fall back on. Well, no one really said we couldn't. Yeah, um, basically. And you know, even though that's not the argument that they're presenting, that's kind of really the only. thing thing that they, it's what's shining through yeah, at this moment it's what comes out of it for yeah. sure um and so i think that's the question is is you know wh- how much blame do we put on the companies how much blame do we put on ourselves as investors and shareholders for the expectations that we have of publicly traded companies how much blame do we put on our local and state governments for failing to regulate businesses how much do we put how much blame do we put on the federal government for failing to regulate businesses? Um, there's certainly there's a lot of blame to go around. And I think the argument is really who is assigned the blame right now and what do we do about it? Um, and yeah. what do we do to make sure it doesn't happen again? Well, hopefully um, some regulation will regulations will be passed, but that sure. takes time and it... I mean, when you have someone who's literally saying, I'm a very conservative and pro-business Republican, but I'm sickened to see what I've heard, that's agreement across the aisle. That's, everyone is pissed that off. That is a step forward, Everyone I guess. is upset. So, um, Hopefully we'll see some change, but, you know, fingers yeah. crossed. Yeah, it's uh, uh, partially a product of the system that we live in and yeah. partially a product of what seems like just pretty awful corporate greed at times. So... Mm. Um, that's really, I guess, all I have to say about that. Um, so on that cynical note. <laughs> yeah, on that just lovely high note. We typically, we try to end on high notes. Um, but this week, I mean, it hasn't been 
Yeah, it's I not, mean, at least Netflix is getting yeah, more original Netflix, content. Netflix, more original Netflix <laughs> shows. Yay. You can binge watch more. Elf Beauty IPO. Woo. Yay. Cheap makeup. Yeah, rest on, on those laurels. Um, Brad and Angelina broke up and everyone's sad. <laughs> uh, so, yes, um, if you want our full coverage of all of these stories, um, they are going to be available in the links, in the articles. Um, remember to like, share, follow, do everything that you do. Um, thank you for joining us this week, and we will see you next week.